Rich, it's great to be back with you. I, I loved the visit last year and uh, looked forward to being with you again today. For those of you who don't know, uh, CPAS is uh, patrons to this church, uh, which means that during a vacancy, we're responsible for helping you to find a new vicar. Um, we're also one of the mission agencies that you support. And so it's good for me to be here on Bible Sunday because CPAS essentially is a UK-based mission agency. And it was formed back in 1836 in order to help uh, men and women and boys and girls hear and discover the good news of Jesus. And over those 200 years, it's been done in a number of different ways, but the vision remains the same, to enable men and women and boys and girls to hear and discover the good news of Jesus Christ. And it may be that over the last few weeks you've been praying for us. We've had about a hundred different holidays taking place um, for boys and girls up and down the country, uh, about 4,000 youngsters and 3,000 volunteers gathering together to look at God's word together, to have fun, to make new friends, and uh, to give them the, the opportunity to hear and discover the good news of Jesus Christ. And of course, that's what we're here for on a Sunday morning as well. We prayed together just before the service that God would speak to us. We, um, we paused after the first two songs to see if God had got anything to say to us. We've just sung a song in which we said, Lord, speak to us. I think part of my purpose is to try and help us hear the voice of God together. And actually, I'm, I could do with a few moments to pause and reflect because I think I heard God speak to us through the prayers as well. I, I don't know about you, but I felt like something about, I didn't, didn't know your name, but the way that the prayers were led this morning just helped us to, to engage with things that really matter. And that's the point of the Word of God. That's why we study the Scriptures. Last week, I was in a, a gift shop and I saw a mug I had written on it, everyone is entitled to my opinion. I thought, I thought, I thought it was a good mug. Uh, I, I didn't buy it. Um, but I, I don't know about you, I also get rather frustrated by all the opinions. We're awash with opinions, aren't we? We've got two major events coming up. Well, at least it depends what, how you view life. But we have two major events coming up. We've got the Scottish referendum and some of the 930 congregation. We're talking about that and giving their opinions and thoughts and wondering how it's going to go. And the other great event, does anybody know what it is? Yeah, the launch of iPhone 6. And, um, <laughs> and if, you, if you look on the technology, I'm not going to buy one, by the way, but if you look on the technology websites, and you have to be quite sad to do this, um, what, what you can find is you can find rumours about what the iPhone 6 might be like with very little evidence, actually, apart from a shady photograph from some Chinese photographer. But, you know, there will be rumours. But more than that, underneath the rumours, there will be people's opinions about those rumours. And more than that, there will then be people's responses to the opinions that people have about rumours. And then, of course, if you carry on and you're really sad, keep going down the blog, you'll find opinions about the rumours, about the speculation about the views, and etc., etc., etc. You know, we are awash with opinions. But today we gather to remind ourselves that we are not simply subject to human opinion, but we have a God who is wisdom. We have a God whose motives are love. We have a God whose example is service and sacrifice. We have a God whose wisdom is true. And that is why I love the scriptures. I love it because it brings me back to a place which is tried and tested over millennia and amid the sea of opinions of a place I can return to that says, here's some solid ground. Jesus said, if you build your life on these words of mine, you're like a man who builds his house upon the rock. That's why we pray that God would speak to us. That's why we study the scriptures. Here is one scripture that means a great deal to me, and I think in the times that we've just been praying about, this is an important scripture. Next slide, please. 
Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 says this, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you stand firm in the one spirit, contending shoulder to shoulder for the sake of the gospel, without being frightened in any way of those who oppose you. Paul is praying that Christians would have a unity that is built around a way of life that is holy and blameless. It's not about Christians finding some sort of boring conformity. We are made to be different, and richly so. This is not about unity at any price, where we lift the corner of the carpet and we sweep things underneath, bed it down and hope that no one notices. This is about people straining forward towards a common future under the watchful eye of a loving God who has given us a message to be passed on. Paul writes, I passed on to you that which is of first importance. This is above all the other things we talk about. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, i.e. it was intended. That he, that he died, that he was buried. Then that he rose again according to the scriptures. It was intended. He rose again and appeared to us. Contending shoulder to shoulder for the sake of the gospel, I was glad to hear about the mission that you've been involved in. I've got one or two friends at Frinton Free Church and uh, glad to see that you're working together with them and the other churches too. Next slide, please. Matthew 18 is one of those chapters that when you read it, you think, oh my word, there's so much good stuff in here. It starts by talking about destructive forces that are at work around us. We've prayed about that. It goes on to talk about the significance and importance of protecting children and the vulnerable in our society. Jesus was very keen to point out who the marginalized were and make sure that special honors was given to them. And some of the stories we've re read recently about places where Folks have misused the access to children that church has given to them. We should grieve over those because Jesus said that's not how it should be. That when children are part of this community, they'll be loved, they'll be nurtured, they'll be invested in and will grow. And similarly, Matthew 18 goes on to talk about those of us who are children in the faith. We might not be young, but we're new to the faith. We're still trying to figure out what it means. And God says, for those who have a fragile faith, protect them, guard them, nurture them, and so on. Then it goes on to talk about following up those who are lost, not just thinking about ourselves and our needs, but, but following up people, making sure that what we've found in Christ is made available to others. And then finally, and this is the one that our reading is on for today, about the way that we handle arguments and disagreements within the church. Matthew chapter 18 gives us a really good model to do that. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, maybe the one after that as well, actually. Thank you. So workable principles for handling disagreements. Firstly, we will fall out with each other. We will fall out with other churches. We will fall out with all sorts of different people. There's two reasons for that. One is we are human and we are fallible and we are frail. And part of our fallen humanity actually loves a bit of an argument. Uh, can, be, can find gossip about disagreements quite tasty. We can, we can do that. It's part of our fallen humanity. But the second reason is that uh, if we believe passionately about something then we will hold that view and argue for it robustly. In fact, taking a step to one side, a chap called Patrick Lencioni, who writes about businesses and health, uh, emotional health of businesses, uh, says that the level one of a good business is that there is an atmosphere of trust. And level two is that there is healthy conflict. Because he said the absence of conflict might mean that we don't trust each other. Or the absence of conflict might mean we don't care enough about anything. But the point about conflict in Matthew 18 is not that we have it. The point is that we resolve it and we deal with it. 
And then it goes on to talk about some principles for doing that. Number one, if you have a disagreement with someone, if you've fallen out with someone, well, speak to them one-to-one, -one, as far as you're able. Now, that's not always what comes naturally, is it? So, is that my phone, do you think? So somebody, somebody somewhere, you know, you're, you're, you're having a conversation, they say something, you take offence about it. Uh, the first temptation I find, do you find, is actually to talk to someone else about it. You'll never guess what so-and-so said the other day. And then, and then they may say, well, I've always thought that about them. That, that doesn't surprise me. That, that just confirms everything I've ever thought. And that person's wandered off to talk to somebody else. And that other person has said, oh, yeah, well, that Graham Archer, I'm not surprised. And before you know where you are, the battle lines are drawn. And it started as a misunderstanding between two people. I told the story earlier of a bloke who left my church when I was leading one in Felixstowe. He heard me talking about a weekend at Sizewall. And he never came to church again. I went to visit him after hearing that he'd fallen out with me and he'd been talking to people and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Went to visit him. I said, what's going on? He said, oh, you're just a rabid socialist, you are. I was thinking, is that right? I wasn't aware of that. He said, going and chaining yourself to the railings at Sizewall? I said, no, I'm taking the church on a holiday. It's a parish weekend at Sizewall Hall that's next to the power station. Different kind of power station. But I wonder how many people he told about that terrible vicar and, do you know what I mean? Maybe I would have chained myself to the power station. But anyway, <laughs> that's a different issue. But it, I just say that to, to illustrate the way it goes. Uh, and Jesus says, go and speak privately. If you think you've got a misunderstanding with someone, I've given grace to you that you didn't deserve. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. If possible, take the step. Now, sometimes the issue is a big one. Sometimes the issue has got to such a point. And so Matthew goes on to say, you know what, if you can't, if you can't resolve something one-to-one, -one, well, involve a neutral person or maybe two neutral people who, who love you enough to be able to sit in the room with you. I mean, a lot of marriage guidance is like this. It's not that husbands and wives can't talk to each other, it's that they're unable to keep the way in which they talk to one another in a way that is helpful. And the presence of a counsellor or somebody else is just to help the conversation progress without it becoming destructive in itself. And then it goes on to say that there are some things that arise, and I think this is what's happened with one or two of the child abuse things, where it says, you know what, sometimes things shouldn't be kept hidden, but you should be aware that there's an issue and know that it's being addressed. And sometimes when particular conflicts are very toxic and very negative, we need drastic attention. Now, I look at that and I think, you know what, isn't that great that the Bible is that practical, is that sensible? in order to help us to resolve things. And I love the way that it ends, because it then ends by saying, and if that person still won't repent, treat them as a tax collector or a sinner. And you look at that and you think, yeah, I don't know what one of those is, but yeah, yes, exactly. And then you look at how Jesus related to tax collectors and sinners. He was called a friend of them, wasn't he? You know, there is always the possibility of grace in order to resolve these things that happen. Now, in order for us as a church and a community to be fit for purpose in the coming years, whatever challenges they hold, you and I need to begin to express that kind of radical determination to be one with one another. Now, my sense is the, the lovely thing about resolve conflict is that relationships become stronger than ever. Last night, I was invited to go and speak at an event in Felixstowe. The person who invited me, the first time I met him, we had a blazing row on the first evening. He'd arranged something, I'd arranged something, it didn't fit together, it was a public event, and it was like, what are you doing? 
We never knew who was right and we never knew who was wrong. But before we went last night, we sat and laughed about it. Because actually the resolution of our misunderstanding brought us to a closer place than we probably would have been without it. Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. And why does it matter? Because Matthew then goes on to say what this is all about. He says this. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. See, God doesn't just want us to resolve stuff in order to feel better. He wants us to believe in stuff enough that occasionally we'll be too robust and it'll flow over, but nevertheless, as we resolve things, as we find grace and come back together to a place of unity, the stronger, the the deeper, the better unity will bring us to a place where we're on our knees, crying out to God for grace and mercy, not just for ourselves, but for the world in which we live too. That's why it matters. There's something about blessing on earth that releases blessing in heaven too. I wonder if that that, that little phrase about things you bind on earth will be bound in heaven reminds you of Peter. In heaven as on earth. Next slide, I think. The untangling of human conflict releases the possibility of spiritual liberation and vice versa. And so Peter was told, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the keys of heaven on earth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. As we release people from the way that we have bound them and held them in negative thought, In condemnation, we release the possibility of blessing and of mercy. Why does it matter? Conflict can be healthy, but it needs resolution. Conflict resolution can lead to a greater sense of trust and fellowship, and fellowship unlocks the work of God. And so as I conclude... The model of the New Testament is never really individuals working together. Jesus sent out the two by two. The 12 went out in pairs. The 72 went out in pairs. And there's a lovely story in 2 Corinthians where Paul says, um, uh, uh, we were praying, we were working, and the Lord opened up an opportunity for us to go to Macedonia. And then it says, but I didn't take it because I couldn't find Titus. Because there's something about the gospel that is best seen in mature Christian relationships. Relationships not just between us and our friends. Relationships between ourselves and other people with different social standing or educational background, colour or creed. Relationships that are built with our young people and our children. That this is the place where not only the children groups are safe, but where the older members love to hear their stories, and vice versa. The gospel is best seen in relationships that are built even where there was conflict. I do think we need to pray for Christians in Scotland over the next few weeks. Because I, I, I hear from folks that within families there are some that are not speaking to each other because of the votes that are being taken. We need to play, pray for our Christians in Syria, don't we? Our Christians in all sorts of places that we've never been to, but they are our brothers and sisters. We are one with them in Christ. To conclude, the book of Amos is a book that I've been reading in my own personal devotions just recently. And uh, thinking about the fact that we've all got Bibles and it's online and it's You know, we've got fellowship, we can talk to one another, we can listen to God together. 
Under the judgments of Amos in chapter 8, there's something about a lack of food and there's something about a lack of water and there's something about wars and all those sorts of things like that. But it says this in verse 11. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when there will be a famine throughout the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of God. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of God and they will not find it. I just want to encourage you and affirm you in your desire to hear the word of God, both in the scriptures, through sermons, through prayers, and all the rest. And in these days of opinion, let that be one of our defining qualities. Amen.